Well, let me welcome you to uh, Institute Encounters. Uh, this is the second uh, of our interview series for the 2014-2015 academic year. Um, and today, uh, we're honored to have uh, an old friend and colleague, uh, Professor Michael Krauss of the George Mason Law School, um, who will be talking to us this evening um, about the rule of law and the decline of the rule of law in the United States. But I wanted, uh, in this particular interview, to get at some, I think, related matters, um, but uh, which operate at a different level um, within our constitutional political system. Uh, among the various things that you have written about uh, are legal ethics. And uh, clearly, ethics and law have a relationship to each other. Uh, they are both sets of rules. Um, they have uh, uh, different enforcement mechanisms uh, to some degree, but they're both sets of rules uh, that all of us, and certainly professionals in the law, uh, are supposed to follow. Um, I, I gather you think that uh, uh, legal ethics have always been an issue, but I, I, I gather that you think legal ethics are especially an issue uh, nowadays, and, and if that's so, maybe you can tell us why. Sure. Uh, first, it's a great pleasure to be here, Steve, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I don't think it's a one- or two-year-old phenomenon. I think it's a 20- or 30-year-old phenomenon, but I think legal ethics is a, um, an acutely important issue in the United States today. It has been for 20 or 30 years. Maybe I can set this up by just um, uh, recalling a massive study that Johns Hopkins University did with a uh, tremendous grant that they got, I think, from the Carnegie Foundation, although it might be from a different foundation, in the late 1990s. And they did a study of 95-odd um, professions. By professions, they meant think, uh, areas of work where you needed a government certification to be able to legally work in the area. So it could be anything from physicians to lawyers to architects to real estate agents, for example. And uh, it was a tremendously well-funded study, and they um, uh, uh, had large sample sizes. Uh, they ended up concluding, um, to make a long story short, that uh, of all the professions, lawyers had the highest suicide rate. Lawyers had the were most likely to regret having um, chosen their profession, or least likely to want their children to continue in their profession. Um, um, had the highest substance abuse rate, whether it be alcohol or drugs, etc. And when 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 the issue was plumbed further, was probed further, uh, it turned out that a lot of these lawyers really hated the work that they did and didn't think that they did good work, ethically good work. Ended up despising themselves to some extent uh, because they realized that they betrayed to some extent the reasons why they'd gone to law school, or the people that they were when they went to law school, let's put it that way. Um, so uh, this is really, so, so that's, it, it, it's, it's in fact when I, when I got that study, when I read that study that I started becoming interested in legal ethics, it wasn't something I was teaching at the time, but I have done now for um, probably about uh, 17 or 18 years and um, published a book and several articles on, on, on the topic. So yeah, it, it is um, a real problem in the United States. The, um, uh, state bar associations are somewhat aware of it. They make efforts more or less serious, depending on the state, more or less frequent, um, to try to address this. And of course, I really think that law schools have a um, tremendously important role to do this. Well, what are the some of the characteristic situations that arise nowadays and present ethical problems? Well, um, the uh, so lawyers have a dual function, and it's this dual function that that is the cause of the ethical. Uh, dilemmas. They've always had this dual function. They represent people uh, or corporations, but they represent people, legal people or physical people, and they are officers of the court at the same time. Their duties as officers of the court are 24-7. Uh, there's nobody looking over their shoulder. Uh, their clients are looking over their shoulder to make sure that their interests are uh, defended. There's nobody but ethics looking over their shoulder to determine that uh, their duties as officers of the court are complied with. And so what you've seen in the past uh, 30 years or so is a, um, a tremendous increase in uh, the size of law firms, a um, 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 uh, uh, 
structure, uh, pyramid uh, kind of a structure where associates uh, never really deal with clients, uh, but are just given orders by partners and are billed out at a uh, at an amount way higher than the amount that the associates are paid, uh, and then are weaned off after three or four years, fired, and new associates hired on as sort of a pyramid scheme. It becomes very easy um, for that uh, cloistered associate uh, to go with the flow, not to have to deal with courts or with clients, uh, to do what the partner tells them to do, to uh, believe that they are nothing but hired guns for um, um, somebody who is paying an hourly, an exorbitant hourly rate. That is a change in the structure of the profession that's about 30 or 40 years old and it's brought with it um, tremendous ethical challenges. So it's sort of the bureaucratization of the legal profession and the disengagement of many of the practitioners at the associate level from the culture and obligations of the courtroom. You know, as recently as, uh, as 10 years ago, half of our lawyers practice so low as recently as 10 years ago. And if you go back 30 years ago, about 80% of all lawyers practiced solo. Today, about a quarter of all lawyers practice solo. So there are people now who believe that their role is really no different than the role of somebody who might go work for, say, Morgan Stanley after they finish um, a business school, that they are going into a business. They're not going into a profession that has ethical rules that transcend the interests of the of the client. Um, the solo lawyer was always sort of the, if I could if I could use an image that many viewers might be familiar with, the Atticus Finch of the village, uh -huh. of, the, of, the, of the town, the respected person who made a decent income but wasn't ridiculously wealthy. Uh, nobody would compare him with the local stockbroker. Today, um, the law student, many law students who um, uh, contemplate graduation, contemplate salaries equal to the salary of the uh, Morgan Stanley hotshot that goes on to Wall Street and, and does deals. And so the notion of a noble profession with um, duties to the public wheel that transcend uh, and override it, in, some, in many cases, uh, duties to the client, um, uh, 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 fade into the background. Now, there are kind of two sets, I would think, because in the business world, even though they're not public officers in any sense, uh, there's still a notion of, of ethics. Uh, I, I would think there are, there are two uh, universes, ethical universes, within which a, a lawyer might be said to be functioning. Uh, one uh, is the ethics toward the client in terms of fair and honest dealing uh, and in uh, giving value uh, for money, uh, fair value for money, and, and then uh, there would be the ethical obligations uh, that here in being a quasi-public official, uh, in being an officer of the court. Uh, are there ever instances in which uh, those two ethical universes collide in a way that requires not a choice between being ethical and unethical, but a choice between being ethical in different ways? So, short answer, yes. Uh, longer, uh, slightly longer answer, not only are there um, 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 uh, shocks between these two different types of ethical obligations, but even, but, there are, but even inside one of those two realms, for example, duties to the client, there are ethical temptations. For example, and this is, a, this is endemic to some extent to uh, many jobs where it's very difficult to gauge the output. Um, somebody comes to you with a deal, a merger, that they need done legally. Do they know whether this merger takes you 20 hours of legal work or whether this merger takes you 250 hours of this legal work? No, they really don't. Uh, they don't often know. Um, what is the temp obviously, what's the temptation? The temptation is to, uh, if, if this law firm wants me to bill 2,300 hours this year, oh my goodness. Um, you know, I was sort of thinking about the client while I was taking the shower. Let me bill my shower time to this client. Uh, who will know? Will anybody know the difference? Nobody will know the difference except me deep down. Maybe 10 years from now, eventually I start hating myself for being this kind of person as I was talking to you, as I was mentioning the Johns Hopkins study indicates that this sort of thing happens. So even inside the, the, the one realm, duties to the client, there are issues. Then there, and as you say, there, there, there are duties to the court, which are... Uh, fairly clear. You can't uh, contribute to a fraud on the court. You can't uh, suborn perjury, for example. Um, uh, on the other hand, your client may tell you something 
in uh, what the client believes to be full confidence um, that is incompatible with uh, what the client wants to say on the stand. Uh, the client uh, might reveal to you something horrific. Uh, a case that I deal with with my students involves a client who tells his lawyer that he, a client who's charged with murder, who tells his lawyer that not only has he committed this murder, but he's committed four other murders for which uh, he's not yet been charged, and he knows where the body, and here's where the bodies are. And meanwhile, in this city, they are desperately searching for four young uh, children, um, and the parents are hoping against hope that these children are still alive. And, and of course, if they're dead, they want uh, Christian burials for these children, and they're desperately searching for their bodies. The lawyer now knows where these bodies are. Uh, the lawyer was told this on, in confidence. What should the lawyer do? So there are. That's the kind of that's the kind of shock between two different um, ethical realms. But I don't want to diminish that even inside each ethical realm, um, uh, and especially as regards duties to the client, I believe that the clients are um, uh, victims of uh, unethical behavior by lawyers more than had been the case uh, uh, until relatively recently. And and it's largely overbilling. Uh, it might be overbilling, it might be um, quote unquote double billing. Um, so, to give you an example, um, I flew here from DC to Dallas Fort Worth and Dallas Fort Worth to Lubbock. Uh, what if I was doing this for a client and not for you? Um, that was three hours to DFW and another hour to Lubbock. Should I bill those four hours to you even if I'm reading a novel? Uh, even if I'm getting pleasure out of reading a novel. That's one issue. Let me make the issue even more acute. Instead, so let's say one would say, yes, bill him the four, bill the four hours because uh, uh, you're, you're, you're spending this time in the interest of the client. You're coming to Lubbock for some deposition. You need to be here for the client. Well, what if I'm spending those four hours not reading a novel, but reading a brief in another case for another client? Should I bill both that other client and you for the same four hours? Billing eight hours when I've only worked four hours. Let's say that I've um, done a lot of research on a particular case and have become uh, pretty much the national expert uh, on a very narrow field. And uh, gosh, that first client, I did stellar work for that client and I did 100 hours of work and I billed that client 100 hours. Client number two comes by and says, um, I'd like to uh, exploit your, your knowledge in this field and hire you. Uh, can I bill that second client for the 100 hours uh, again, even though I already know it and I'm only working an hour because I'm much more efficient because I, I know I have this knowledge already. These are temptation. These are, these are situations very often where there's nobody looking over your shoulder. It's just the angel on your shoulder. Is there an obvious answer to there's that? There's an obvious answer to all these questions. I hope that all the viewers <laughs> know what the obvious answer is. If they don't, then, then I guess it's not as obvious as, as it might be, but I would think that common sense ethics. The, the sad thing is that... Could you, could you bill the second client for the full amount and then return half of it to the first client? What you, no. What you can do, of course, is if you are much more learned after that first round, you can raise your rates if you wish and say, I'm now much more learned and if you want to hire me, I will cost this much instead of the lower amount before. But then they know up front and it's only taking you an hour to do this work, of course, as opposed to the however many hours that you uh, were able to bill at a lower rate because you were a rookie and you didn't have this expertise. Um, so sure, as long as the client comes in knowing what they're going to pay per hour, but no, billing the, billing the 100 hours twice, um, that doesn't work. Um, billing eight hours when you've worked four hours, that doesn't work. Um, I like to give another example to my students. Um, let's say you drive 15 miles to get to work as, a, as an attorney at the law firm every day and it takes you it takes you an hour to drive those 15 miles in rush hour traffic and uh, of course you can't bill anybody for that hour you're not doing legal work that's just on you that's just part of your life you get to work uh, but today you're going to be in court all day uh, for Smith in the Smith case so the courthouse is 15 miles in another direction so you take that 15 miles you're driving 15 miles to the courthouse and it, caught, it takes you an hour to drive to the courthouse. Should you be able to bill for that hour? And my students ultimately say, well, sure, that's, that's, you're billing for Smith. Well, wait a second, if you weren't billing for Smith, you'd have been at work that day, and you wouldn't have billed that one hour. You're not driving any more than you used to drive. There's no opportunity cost. There's no opportunity cost here. 
um, and and we could go on and on. You bring in a, a um, you bring in a, you stay just late enough. This is a frequent practice. You stay just late enough at work to bring in dinner. You have it catered. You call the local Chinese restaurant, and they bring in a dinner, and you're working on the Smith case. So this goes. So the cost of dinner goes to Smith. But wait a second. If you hadn't, would would you have perhaps have purchased food yourself anyway? Didn't you need to eat anyway? Uh, should the should you deduct the cost of what dinner would have cost you had you eaten on your own? This is and you know there are quite a few. This is common sense. I would. So is it fair to say that that most of the ethical problems that arise with respect to clients have to do with billing? Uh, no, uh, a lot of them. A lot of them have to do with billing. I don't think I would go off the top of my head. I, it's not clear to me that most have to do with billing. Some have to do with conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, most people don't just represent one client. Some people do. They're called in-house counsel. They only have one client. Uh, but most lawyers have more than one client. What if those clients have opposing interests? Uh, you hire me uh, because you want me to. Um, represent you in a real estate closing and I have some other client though who really wants that land and he pays me 10 times more each year in fees than you pay me uh, are my loyalties going to be am I going to be less than less less uh, 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 interested in getting you in negotiating uh, uh, for you or if the, if, if the deal falls through perhaps uh, this other client's going to pick up the, the land and I'll and, and you'll never know that I that so I didn't have a card enough for have you. Temptation to sabotage anybody who's got more than one client, mm -hmm. and that means ninety nine percent of attorneys. Anybody who's got more than one client has to think about ethics for that reason alone. Because just when you go into the office at nine a.m. or whatever in the morning, you got to decide who to work on and whose case that you're going to work on and how to work on it. And if you've got more than one client, then you've got more than one call. On your time, so there are many, many ways in which conflicts of interest can uh, uh, can exist. Um, um, uh, confidentiality issues uh, are not the same as billing issues. You know, people come in and tell you that they um, have committed an offense. Uh, what are your duties? Uh, what if people tell you that they intend to? Com Somebody comes and tells you that there's a Sunday closing law in their state, and they say. Um, you know, I can't afford to comply. My county has a, has a blue law, and the courts have upheld it, and I've got to close on Sunday, and I'm right near the county line, and my competitor right across the way, he's open, he's taking all my business. So darn it, I'm just going to stay open and pay the fine. Okay, I'm going to stay open and pay the fine. That's all there is to it. So he's announcing to you that he's intending to commit an infraction in the future. Do you have duties uh, as an officer of the court to subvert your client's uh, goals, or do you have duties to say be an accessory to that crime by facilitating uh, your client's uh, violation of the law? Let's say you don't agree with the law. Let's say people come to see you and they want to protest in front of an abortion clinic, and you inform them that the protest that the uh, protest will be illegal because the Supreme Court has upheld laws that restrict the distance from the clinic. Uh, a minimum that created minimum distance for protesters to uh, stay from the clinic. And they say, well, you know, we're law-abiding people. None of us have ever committed a crime, but we feel very strongly about this. But in fact, we're not, we're so scared of being arrested that we're not going to even go ahead with this unless you agree in advance to be our attorney. Now, as I indicate to my students, you know, these, these, um, you're becoming an accessory before the fact now to, to this crime because you're facilitating, as opposed to being a criminal defense attorney after the that they consult after they've been arrested, you're now, they, they will not commit the crime unless you agree in advance to represent them. That's called being a, an accessory before the fact. Now, even though what you're committing yourself to is entirely legal. And what if you actually believe in the same cause that these people believe in? So there were attorneys who broke the law, who utterly broke the law to uh, to help the Underground Railroad. I give an example to my I give examples to my students of of uh, attorneys in Maryland, uh, for example, that helped um, um, escaping slaves escape to Pennsylvania, escape to the North. This was a you know um, uh, sh should attorneys do this? Should they not do this? These are things that I think students well, have any, to. Any attorney who advertises, if you're in trouble with the law, come to me. And in some senses. Doing that? No, because the trouble already exists. They're, they're not facilitating the crime 
beforehand. The, 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 what they're talking about is somebody who has already done something that has gotten them in trouble, and now they're going to see an attorney. That's a very different thing than helping uh, uh, somebody commit the crime. Well, with if, it's, if, it's, if it's up on a billboard, the attorney is planting in the minds of many people that if they ever get into trouble, Here's the guy to go to. But if that billboard ever says "phone me before you commit the crime," I'll help you get I'll help you get away with it. That's that's not going to work out. So, uh, and, and by the way, I don't believe that attorneys should always obey all laws. Uh, I'm not one of those people who believe that all laws are always ethical. That we now have a right in America that we didn't used to have a right under slavery, and we didn't used to have a right under Jim Crow, but now we've got it totally right. So we must obey all laws. That's clearly yeah, so. That so a lawyer who would have helped. Uh, facilitate the operation of the Underground Railroad, violating the Fugitive Slave Act and all sorts of other laws, would, 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 would in, in, in your view, have been ethically and morally right in so doing. I've got a, um, a uh, right where your diplomas are in my office, I've got this big uh, rectangular thing that says, for God, for country, and for Yale, which is my alma mater. Um, uh, country only comes second in that, um, in that order, so sure. Well, let's return to that, but before we do, uh, the ethical obligations that a, a lawyer has as an officer of the court, um, clearly they, can't, how, how, how do they conflict with those that he has to his client? Well, so for, so, so for example, um, if somebody announces to me that um, they're, they're conducting uh, an illegal, say, uh, a gambling operation, and um, they want to, they want my assistance in covering up this so that the state never finds out about it. That's obviously, I cannot do that. I mean, I simply can't, I may not do that. Um, do you have to inform the state that you're doing it? It, uh, it? Lead, uh, as far as positive law is concerned, it depends on the state. Mm -hmm. But in my state, for example, Virginia, the answer is unequivocally yes. So if somebody announces to me that they intend to commit a crime in the future, I must, under Virginia ethical rules, first try to dissuade them from doing so. And if I'm unable to dissuade them from doing so, then I must inform authorities, which means I must breach confidentiality. And, and if they tell you they have committed a crime, that's the a very different story. You're defending them. Right. No, that's a very different story. If they tell me they've committed a crime, then I can't I can't allow them to perjure themselves on the stand and say they didn't commit the crime. That I can't allow them to do. But I, of course, can defend them uh, by pleading what we call not. People have a misconception. When you plead not guilty in a criminal uh, case, you're not really pleading not guilty. What you're really saying is, I demand that the prosecution make its case. And that is a constitutional right that we have, um, not to suffer pun criminal punishment unless the state makes its case. So the criminal is not obliged to help the state make its case. For example, he's not obliged to testify against himself under the Fifth Amendment. He can, he can, he can keep quiet. And so I can force the state to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. You can impugn the reliability of witnesses who attest to seeing the commission of a crime it that he has confessed to you. I, it depends how I impugn them, in my mm -hmm. opinion. It depends entirely how I, how I impugn them. If I impugn them uh, by suggesting that they're perjuring themselves when I know that they're not perjuring themselves, no, in my opinion, I absolutely may not do that. You can't suggest If they happen to have 2100 vision and weren't wearing their glasses, can I point that out? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything unethical about pointing that out, but that's not the same as as uh, asserting something to be true that I know not to be true. How far could you go? Um, you know, um, it's actually quite interesting when you when you observe criminal defense attorneys being um, questioned on TV, often on reality TV shows like Dateline or something like this. Um, you can really quite easily tell the ethical ones from the unethical ones. And how could you? Do that? Uh, for example. Uh, let, let me imagine two, uh, two polar extremes. One who says, uh, my client didn't do it. My client is utterly innocent and is going to be vindicated. Let's stop the tape there for a second. Unless the lawyer was there, he doesn't know that his client didn't do it. Unless the lawyer was a witness. Second lawyer. Uh, the state's evidence we don't think is, is strong enough to establish my client's guilt. We believe that there's clearly reasonable doubt. Uh, in my client's case. That's not the lawyer stating that it's her personal belief that the client is in fact uh, uh, innocent or guilty. That's the lawyer stating 
uh, uh, that the state has the obligation to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, and that they don't have to help the state do this, and they don't think the state's met its burden. That's perfectly appropriate uh, to do. Uh, the lawyers that cross the line, and there are quite a few, will, um, uh, uh, they seem to be more zealous, but they're zealous at the price of, of, of crossing a very important ethical line. Now, uh, the ethics of being a lawyer, whether ethics to the client or ethics to uh, the courtroom, uh, are, like everything else, obligations that presumably have some deeper foundation. Uh, right. And that deeper foundation is identical, perhaps, to the foundation of, of the law itself and, and what makes law um, worth obeying. What, 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 the, what the command is sure. uh, of law and people's obedience. And, and uh, there are many contesting schools. Um, there are positivists who simply argue that it's whatever legislatures say. Uh, there are, with at least respect to constitutional interpretation, originalists which argue that, uh, well, I guess you can, be an, you can be an originalist and a positivist at the same time. Same. The originalist simply saying it's what the, the Constitutional Convention uh, wanted, um, and, and subsequent legislators are bound, and courts are bound, uh, to adhere to that intent. But you can go beyond both those things uh, and argue that uh, there is a higher authority, I keep thinking of the Hebrew National Commercials here, where kind of Uncle Sam looks up and says, we have a higher authority. Uh, and that would be um, a natural law position, which is, I gather, the position that, that you take in these matters. Maybe you could explain what that is. A, a famous uh, British philosopher once wrote the following ditty, a two-liner, if I recall, um, that goes like this. Making innumerable statutes men merely confuse what God achieved in ten. <laughs> um, uh, so the, uh, it, 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 it's fairly clear that if the law rests on a foundation of quicksand, uh, if there's no moral foundation for the law, then there's no real duty to obey the law. Why would we obey the law? One reason to obey the law is because the state will whack you if you don't. Uh, again, yeah, that's a positivist view, is that all that a command is, is uh, a gun pointed at you. And so that the state's order not to kill anybody is no different than my order to give me your money or, 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 or I'll take your life. Um, but that denies the whole notion of legitimacy of the state. The robber doesn't have a legitimacy that the state has. The robber doesn't produce what H.L.A. Hart called the internal point of view, the, the feeling that one has a duty to obey the law. There's no duty to obey a law that is, that is, that is, that is grounded on quicksand, that is, that is built on a foundation of quicksand. So um, clearly the legitimacy of the law will depend, I think, principally on the solidity of its moral foundation. Um, uh, as far as I know, there have always only been two candidates for um, the source of such moral foundation, uh, one being apparently reason, uh, and one being, say, God or a, transcend a transcendent objective uh, uh, morality extant out there in the universe. When you say apparently reason, does it suggest a bit of skepticism about whether reason is sufficient? It might, it might suggest which, which of those two branches of the tree is, is the one that I... Uh, it suggests a Humean... It suggests that, uh, that I think, uh, you know, Hume had a point, wondering how we get from is to ought. Um, um, uh, perhaps, yes, but... Um, uh, for the purposes of your question, I don't need to. I don't need to decide that issue. I think um, yes, the the um, um, the view that there's a natural law that is to say that there's something about the human condition, whether it be derived from revelation or from reason, mm -hmm. that there's something about the human condition that requires that we have certain obligations towards others, uh, either negative or perhaps even positive obligations towards others. That that. Um, that any legal system that ignores that, that is not built on that, is a legal system that is uh, perhaps not worthy of obedience. And, and where would you say that uh, you can find the, if it's going to be divine authority, the divine authority for our legal system? Oh, I think we, we are clearly a Judeo-Christian um, country. We, are, we, we have a Lockean constitution, and Locke, of course, himself was... Uh, very devoutly religious. Uh, uh, so yes, I think that there's no doubt that we are, our, 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 our vision of the universe is a Judeo-Christian vision. So what, 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 but it, uh, 
Uh, uh, so is is it is it the Ten Commandments or is it a simpler set of rules? Is it the Golden Rule? What, where where where? It's where, all of those. It's, it's not a simpler set. Of, okay. It's it's more so so so. Um, um, whether Catholic theologians, Jewish theologians, Talmudists have gone way beyond the ten, have have, have uh, so there's a lot of exegesis of the Ten Commandments that can be made, or of the Bible that can be made, and there and and. Um, uh, and uh, to take two contemporaries, uh, Thomas Aquinas and Maimonides, uh, who actually knew each other, were were uh, all about trying to figure out what the rules of behavior should be, uh, in, inferring them, deducing them, or uh, inducing them from uh, uh, from the biblical story. Um, sure, no, I don't think it's simple. I think it's very hard. So it has uh, divine inspiration. Uh, and a certain kind of irreducible core of meaning, but then its application and elaboration requires reason. It does, and it can be very hard. I'll give you an example that, uh, that comes from the other subject that I think I know something about from teaching and writing, which is tort law. So if you find somebody, you're walking down the street, and you find somebody who's had an epileptic seizure, and, they're, and they've fallen unconscious in a, in a puddle that's five inches deep, and they're drowning. And with a slight, yeah, with an expense of two or three calories, you can flip them over, and they won't be drowning anymore. Do you have a duty to flip them over? Do you, should you have a legal duty to flip them over? Do you have a moral duty to flip them over? I think this is abundantly clear. Mm -hmm. uh, should you have a legal duty to flip them Meaning, over? Could you be punished if you did, or sued? If not, not necessarily punished criminally, mm -hmm. but sued in tort, which is the subject that I, uh, the other subject I teach at George Mason Law School. So that 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 th those are di that's a difficult question. Whether we have general duty to rescue our neighbors when the rescue is cheap. Uh, lots of ink has been spilled by people who share the same mm -hmm. Judeo-Christian ethical outlook and who don't agree on that issue. I've got my own view on that issue, but you know, and this goes back, of course, to the story of the Good Samaritan uh, uh, in the Christian Bible. So, the, the, uh, uh, um, uh, what does that mean? Do we have legal duties to help people who are in need, as opposed to merely moral duties? So a very interesting issue for tort law is when should, because tort after all means, the word means wrong in French. The word doesn't mean illegal, it means wrong. It has moral foundation to it. When, when can we do something wrong but not be liable in tort? Are there things that we, or is it the case that every time we do something wrong that harms somebody, we should be liable in tort. You ask me, which way to the hospital, buddy? You're, you've got your wife in the car and she's giving breech birth. You need to get to the hospital quickly. I say this way. You go that way. It's that way. You don't get to the hospital in time. Should I be liable in tort? Did I have a duty to tell you the truth? Do I have a duty not to lie to you ever? Uh, these are really important issues in tort and they are ultimately um, issues about the interface between morality and law. So that is what's in common really to the two areas that I teach, legal ethics and, and tort law, is that they both involve this interface between uh, uh, morality, which I believe to be objective, as you stated, natural law, uh, and, and, and positive so law. What, what sort of situation, maybe we'll come back to the United States in a moment, but what sort of situation does that leave societies that are not Judeo-Christian, say like Japan? Um, is there a moral basis for finding uh, kind of uh, ob objective legal and, and moral rules there that aren't Judeo Christian and well, they go back. I'm not an expert on Japanese law, but I will tell you this. Um, Japan did a really heinous thing and fought a horrific war and mistreated prisoners terribly and was brutally conquered by us. And when they were conquered by us, we went and imposed the Swiss Civil Code on them. We, we translated the Swiss Civil Code. And why did we pick Swiss law? Um, be, I don't know why, because it was a neutral country perhaps, I'm not sure. But we picked the Swiss Civil Code, which is, which is part of the French family of civil codes. There's really a Germanic and a, a, a Gallic. But at any rate, we took the Swiss Civil Code, we translated it to Japanese. And that's their code. So um, all that is to say, uh, I'm not an expert on Japan, but I'm not 100% convinced that they're not today, as it were, in some way, a Judeo-Christian country, because we impose that on them as the price to be paid for the immoral war that they waged. Um, so they and they've and they've and they've 
uh, and they and they don't seem to be unwilling participants in this. Mm -hmm. They seem to be um, the legitimacy of their law is accepted by them today yeah, without becoming Jewish or Christian. Uh, correct, correct. So they, in other words, the spread of Judeo Christianity might be beyond just those areas which are Jewish or Christian. So the Western world has become a lot more secular in the last 40 to 50 years. Um, and what sort of impact has that had, therefore, uh, on our law? I, say nothing I, of our ethics. Sure. Well, I don't think we can say nothing of our ethics. I, mean, I just it's, it's, sort of leave that out for the right. I, yeah, I think the two are related. I think okay. you, so. There's been a, obviously a, ri a tremendous rise of this. Is uh, I'll be talking about this to some extent this afternoon or this evening. Uh, but um, sure, we've had a, a a an exponential increase in the number of laws. Small L laws as opposed to large L law. And I'll get into the difference perhaps between those two um, this evening. But um, um, a, a huge uh, increase in the um, number of directives, um, a um, less of a desire to anchor those in uh, sort of fundamental rights and more in sort of a technocratic achievement of policy goals and uh, more of a focus on outcomes and less of a focus on process. Um, and um, I, I think secularization is not unrelated to that um, because people, uh, it's still a minority of people, but every year a larger percentage of people when you say, you know, why is it bad to, why would it be bad for Smith to kill Jones? We'll say because it's illegal. As opposed to say, and then I'll, you know, I'll ask my students this, and I'll say, what if the governor forgot to sign that law? What if it turns out that it had, the law against murder had to be passed by the state house and the state senate and signed by the governor? It turns out the governor forgot to sign it. Does that mean it's now okay to kill to kill Jones? Well, no, no, it's not really okay. Ah, you're just using the law as an excuse. You know why it's not okay to kill Jones. Um, I don't think the secularization has penetrated has has been soul-destroying. But I'm, I'm reminded of a phenomenal talk I heard before the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was in, of course, I live near Washington, D.C., and we have the advantage of seeing all sorts of interesting people give talks. And I was listening to a talk by um, a Russian dissident linguist uh, at the Heritage Foundation. And she was explaining, and I don't know any Russian, uh, <coughs> Uh, and she was explaining how the Russian language had been utterly impoverished by uh, six or seven decades of communism. Uh, people had lost all moral sense. There was no, this is one of the reasons why we have these Russian mafias today. There's just no moral sense of uh, 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 there's nothing that's intrinsically bad or, or 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 good to do. There's just what's punished by the state and what's not punished by the state. So I think we're slowly going down that route. We're not, we haven't destroyed the, the moral souls the way that the Soviets succeeded in doing to a much greater extent. They didn't do so completely, right? Um, Solzhenitsyn <laughs> still lived and Sakharov and, 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 and the like, but, but uh, yeah, I think that there's a little bit of that. Well, I, you, you said that we, we, we no longer think about outcomes. I hope I have this right. We're more concerned with procedures. No, no, I, I, I was saying the opposite. The opposite. It, 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 right, it's, it's the... Uh, when, when, when all we care about is the outcome, then the end tends to justify the means. And it's when the means are violated that the rule... So a great deal of the moral foundations of the law, in natural law, have to do with how you treat people. Absolutely. About process. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being a consequentialist, just focused eye on the prize. To use um, the Saul Alinsky view of... So, so, you know, if you've got a goal, you've got to reach that goal. Uh, but all of morality, for example, there is a moral way to wage war. You tell people, you know, war, you know, all is fair in love and war. No, no all is not fair in love and war. There's process. There's a way to wage war. You don't do whatever you have to do. Well, more things tend to go beyond, go by boards in war. Morally. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Like an emphasis absolutely. On and yet, and yet we try, we, we believe that we, so are we perfect? Of course not. Is any country perfect? Of course not. Uh, are there countries that wage war much more ethically than other countries do? Of course. Are there countries that don't routinely gas the opponents, uh, for example, that don't use poison, that don't... Uh, well, you know, there's, use... a, there's, there's a warlike mentality in politics as well. Um, that is to say 
when you're fighting a war, let's take the Second World War, where uh, the stakes were immensely high. Yes. Uh, in a war like that, you're apt to think that maybe everything doesn't go, but an awful lot of things might go that, that you would not abide otherwise. I think that's right. Now, and I, I think that's right. As I stated earlier, I think these questions are difficult in practice. But now, let's transfer that into the kind of supposedly peaceful realm of politics. Uh, if you think that politics is kind of a peaceful war, that is to say, the stakes are so high, uh, the wrongs that you're dealing with are so great, the threats that, uh, to, to society that you're trying to uh, uh, foreclose um, are, 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 are so, so encompassingly threatening, uh, then you might, in fact, uh, with that kind of attitude, and I think increasingly you find among folks who think, for example, that the uh, you know the global climate change will soon destroy the world, uh, or there are other kind of entrenched evils so deep that they're very very hard to eradicate, and at the same time very very important. I, I think that lends itself to it may not come to violence, but it lends itself to an attitude toward politics in which process uh, sort of evaporates, and what is really important. Uh, is passing legislation, achieving the goals, that sort of thing. I think descriptively that has to be uh, correct. Um, you and I are probably close to being of the same generation. Um, gosh, I can remember when I was a uh, college student uh, reading The Limits to Growth by the Club of Rome. You may recall the uh, outcry that the, that that book produced. I read it and I became certain that the world was coming to an end. Uh, the world was coming to an end shortly if we didn't do something, and these idiots didn't know what had to be done. Um, with age, hopefully, comes wisdom uh, from time to time, and I think perhaps we should be wise enough to realize that um, um, some hysterical um, fears are exactly that, hysterical, and that we shouldn't, and that they don't justify this kind of uh, abusive uh, process, but on the other hand, uh, did those uh, valiant uh, Germans who uh, plotted illegally, of course, to kill Adolf Hitler act correctly? Yes, I really believe they did. I believe the stakes were very high, and, 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 and what about those lawyers, and many of, most of them were lawyers who subverted American law to help uh, enslaved people escape to Canada. Did they do the right thing? I think they did absolutely the right thing. So um, the, I think the, the key is sort of uh, keep, keep your eye really on the prize, the prize being really fundamental moral truths, fundamental moral truths about, say, the equality of people. Don't try focusing on uh, the latest faddish uh, technical scare and then believe that that also allows you to uh, so if there's a clear and fair. present danger of some enormity uh, taking place, or in fact the enormity is already taking place, then indeed uh, one might be able to divest oneself. So I'll give you an example that without naming names, uh, some of your viewers will know who I'm talking about. Uh, in, um, I believe it was the uh, first Iraq war, but I might be wrong, it might be the second, I'm embarrassed by my memory lapse here, there was an American colonel who had captured um, a, an Iraqi terrorist and the terrorist knew where, there were, where, where, the, where the next bomb was going to be planted uh, in the uh, local town and he asked the terrorist, um, he demanded to know that and was essentially scoffed at and then he took out his gun and he fired, and he fired around, deliberately missing by about an, uh, 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 two inches the guy's head. The bullet went wide, but it was a scary thing, and the guy immediately gave up where the bomb was. The bomb was found. The um, catastrophe that mo most of the victims of which would have been Iraqi civilians, by the way, but some of them might have been American service members, uh, was averted, and the colonel uh, was prosecuted. Um, it's not clear to me that that colonel was justly prosecuted. I won't name any names. The colonel is now a uh, public figure in the United States, and I think he's more um, idolized than he is condemned. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he was prosecuted 
I, I think the, the deeper morality is reflected in the fact that he's more idolized today than he is condemned. Do you think all interests were served by the one hand? Was he convicted when he was prosecuted? I don't. I think I think a deal was struck and he voluntarily left the military. But do you think that kind of result served interests all around? On one hand, uh, reaffirmed the notion of uh, certain rules um, pertaining to how you treat captives, but on the other hand, um, uh, not really carrying the punishment through as far as it might maybe. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Well, I guess the law leaves many things unanswered. At least uh, for common mortals like me. I haven't figured it all out yet. Well, uh, you're an uncommonly good uh, guest and authority, however uh, mortal you may be. And uh, thank you very much for spending your time with us. It's been my pleasure.